Good morning. I'm showing 9 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is Mike DeLaCluse. I'm the president of Lessman Instrument Company. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules this morning to join us for today's webinar, Level Technology 101. This training will answer some of the most common questions about level technology, and it's designed for anyone who selects, specifies, installs, commissions, or maintains level instruments. Our instructor today is Mark Klee uh, of Siemens. Mark is going to discuss the five most common level technologies, ultrasonic, radar, capacitance, pressure, and guided wave. Mark is a senior application engineer uh, for level and weighing products in the western U.S. for Siemens. He has more than 20 years of industrial experience in the oil, gas, water, wastewater, food, and beverage industries, as well as chemical and pulp and paper. Prior to joining Siemens, Mark was responsible for distributed control systems at Honeywell. From 1994 to 2006, he worked as branch manager for North Coast Electric, a Rockwell automation and electrical distributor in the Pacific Northwest. Mark holds a BS degree in electronic engineering technology and a degree in mathematics from Central Washington University. Because of the large number of attendees, we will be muting the phone lines. If you have a question, please type it into the chat tool. If the question is pertinent to the slide Mark is covering, I'll try to get him to answer it immediately. Otherwise, I'll save it to the end of the presentation. Please start thinking about your level questions now. Uh, it's often very important and meaningful part of our, our session. Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you. Go ahead and take it away. All right. Good morning. I'm assuming um, my voice is coming over clear. Loud and clear. Here. All right. Isn't technology a wonderful thing? Uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen and ladies this morning. I'm not sure uh, who all we have in the audience today. One of the, uh, one of the great advantages of uh, this webinar format is you can uh, deliver to a very wide audience across a very wide geographical area. The huge disadvantage is... Uh, I can't see anybody's face in the room, so uh, you know I don't know if there's oftentimes if there's one or sixty or if anybody's asleep. So we'll try and move this along and at least keep it somewhat entertaining and uh, try and uh, deliver some uh, valuable content here. So uh, looking ahead to the agenda this morning, um, I've got a strange pop-up that came up. Did my uh, did my agenda come up there, Mike? No, you're still on the first slide. Hmm. Somehow my sharing is paused. How about now? That's uh, odd. How about now? There you Did, go. Now, now you're okay. good. Okay. Huh, somehow the, the sharing decided to pause on me. All right. Technology is a wonderful thing, isn't it? All right, so we'll start off this morning with a quick safety moment, as I always uh, start my meetings that way. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, level technologies, uh, as Mike mentioned, the five most common. Uh, we'll talk about kind of uh, how do you choose? You've got all these, uh, all these things at your disposal. Which one is best? Um, we'll talk about kind of some additional design criteria, things to take into account. Um, and then you always wrap it up with a summary and question and answer. As Mike mentioned, because of the large audience this morning, uh, if you have questions, just go ahead and type them in. Uh, we'll uh, have an open session at the end as well for questions, but uh, you know, maybe taking them along the way as we go. So uh, launching right into the safety moment, uh, I pulled this photograph out uh, here recently. I really got kind of a chuckle out of it. Looking at this individual, he's uh, got a great aluminum stepladder. Uh, sitting in a nice pool of water here, but if you look real closely at the picture, you'll notice that the guy actually has bare feet. Um, so he's got real nice contact there with the ladder. And then uh, looking a little further up, you'll see that he's actually wet all the way up to the waist because he apparently had waded out into the water to uh, come out to this point. Um, he's uh, operating a 120 volt uh, drill. As you can see, the cord hanging down here. Uh, over a pool of water. There's no apparent line cord or GFI protection for that. Um, I'm not sure how this comes across on your screen, but there's a uh, wire hanging out of the ceiling here 
which uh, apparently is a looks like a 120 volt Romex wire. So with all that, uh, you know, one thing to look at though is he does have his safety glasses on. So at least he's working in a safe manner here this morning. So really, the key takeaway on the safety moment this morning is a lot of times, uh, you know, we might be meeting the minimum requirements for uh, safety protection, but uh, still operating in a very unsafe manner. And as my uh, gentleman uh, here is a great example of that, you know, he, he met the minimum requirements for having the glasses, but uh, there's at least a half dozen other things that are seriously wrong uh, with the installation. So, you know, safety recommendations, I always view them as a minimum. And uh, certainly as I'm out and about in the, uh, uh, in the plants and the sites uh, that are in attendance today, uh, you know, if you see me operating in a uh, unsafe manner, please point it out to me because I'll do the same. If I if I see something and don't understand, I'll call and I'll stop until uh, you know we're all in agreement. So anyway, so there's your key takeaway on the safety. So let's launch into the uh, uh, level measurement this morning. So really, uh, level measurement falls into two basic categories: uh, a point level or discrete measurement. Uh, which is going to be just a uh, on or an off uh, point level. And where we're going to spend most of our time today is talking about this continuous measurement or the analog uh, measurement. And really what I want to talk about with uh, point level is really solid engineering practices mandate or dictate that if you are using a continuous level device, uh, either contacting or non-contacting uh, continuous level device, Really good engineering practices require that you have some sort of point level backup. In other words, uh, that you have some sort of critical high high or low low uh, indication. Generally speaking, when I'm working with end users, uh, if they are using, uh, for example, ultrasonic for their continuous level measurement, I recommend that they use something uh, other than ultrasonic for their point level device. That way, if there is something that is uh, uh, causing a problem with the ultrasonic, it's less likely to uh, affect that uh, point level device uh, in the same way. So an example would be, uh, I've got down here a uh, vibrating fork switch and a, uh, uh, and a rotating paddle switch as some point level devices that basically uh, could be wired in just to a uh, discrete input to give an operator an indication that uh, you know, maybe the level that has been stuck at 12 feet for the last four hours, maybe it's not actually at 12 feet, but that continuous level device has failed in some manner, and they have uh, subsequently hit some critical high high. So anyway, the rest of the time today we're going to talk about continuous level measurement, but generally when I start this, I always uh, ask the audience a question, uh, not really able to answer this easy. Uh, easy this morning in this format, but what's the oldest level technology? Think about it for a minute here. You know, what's been around uh, of all the uh, technologies that are available? A lot of times I get, uh, oh, well, you know, ultrasonic's been around for about 40 years, and, um, you know, that's that's got to be the oldest one, and, you know, sometimes somebody will say a good old Mark V eyeball. Well, you know, that's pretty close. According to the uh, research I've done, the old plumb bob is the uh, oldest technology that's out there, and it is still available today in uh, similar technologies. Uh, I really kind of imagine back, you know, looking at the granaries in uh, ancient Egypt, where you'd have some guy up on the top of the granary, and he's lowering a uh, uh, papyrus rope down with some sort of weight or a rock on the end, have some kind of measurement as far as knots every so far on the uh, rope in order to indicate a, uh, a level. Uh, still available today, and a lot of people with advantages say that this is a really simple uh, level technology. Um, that is true. It is probably the simplest out there. Um, a lot of times uh, I hear from end users that they say, oh, this is a really low cost, uh, a low cost alternative. Um, I usually start to stop a little short of that because uh, a lot of times, yeah, the cost of the, the rope and the rock are pretty inexpensive. But uh, we had an example uh, recently up in the Pacific Northwest, close to where I live, uh, where we had a grain facility, and they had an individual, his entire job, uh, 40 hours a week, 2,080 hours a year, 
was to walk up and down the top of the uh, grain silos with a uh, plumb bob and, or a measuring device, and he would measure the silos uh, there at the uh, facility. Well, a couple of uh, disadvantages to that is, first of all, if you have a uh, you know bob up on top of the uh, up on top of the silo, he may measure that slightly different than Joe or Mary or Sue or another individual. So you really have a non-repeatability uh, in that application. And probably the biggest thing or the biggest soft cost I always see is, uh, you know, the hazard exposure. You have an individual who's out in the weather, the ice and the snow. He's walking uh, 100 plus feet up in the air up on top of a silo. Uh, and uh, he's opening hatches uh, into vessels uh, that you know could go down 100 feet or so. Uh, he's exposed to any dusts or vapors or anything coming out of the site, um, and that could be a uh, you know could be a potential hazard there. Uh, incidentally, the individual uh, in Portland, Oregon, uh, that did this full time, uh, this individual made about eighty thousand dollars a year, and uh, that was his whole job. Uh, what uh, the site elected to do is they actually went to a continuous level, actually a radar level device, uh, measuring their uh, silos in the site. And uh, the guy that uh, had that job, actually they were able to reassign him. He was one of the uh, most senior guys at the site, probably knew more about that site than anybody else. And they were able to uh, reassign him into a position uh, of a bit more authority that uh, you know, gave him the opportunity to use that knowledge that he had acquired over the years. So um, I do also mention, uh, you know, the process damage from a broken cable. Uh, I know recently there was a uh, uh, application here, man, a couple years ago now, where a uh, sugar plant wound up scrapping a uh, large quantity. I heard uh, to the tune of forty to fifty thousand dollars worth of uh, uh, sugar because the food product got contaminated by a cable which had broken off into the uh, food product. So you know, anytime you have um, a measurement device which is touching the material, uh, you could run into that application. And lastly is it's not an instantaneous. If uh, an operator needs a particular level because he has to make a process decision, uh, he would have to call on a radio and get somebody up there to make the measurement. So although the technology is still employed, uh, there's several disadvantages that uh, technology can solve. So launching into, we'll talk about uh, a couple of non-contacting technologies. In other words, you can measure the level without actually touching the material, as you did in the plumb bob. Uh, ultrasonics probably been around for uh, the longest of the non-contacting, and really uh, the non-contacting really operate under a principle of time of flight. So it's the old rate times time equals distance that we all learned in about the sixth grade where you're going to have a transducer or, as you'll see in the next slide, a radar source which is going to send out either an acoustical or an electromagnetic pulse. It's going to measure the time till it uh, bounces down off of material, reflects back, uh, measures the uh, time that it takes. It knows the rate, speed of light speed of, or speed of sound in this case, and then calculates that distance. And then, of course, divides that distance by two because it has to go down and come back. Um, with ultrasonic, uh, really the advantages with that is it's been around for a long time. It's well proven, very, uh, used uh, uh, very frequently, almost exclusively in the water and wastewater industries. Um, can be used in uh, solids applications uh, as well as uh, liquids. And because of the nature of the controller over here, you can't actually uh, have a autonomous uh, vessel or a lot of times lift stations that can operate without a PLC, where all of the uh, control logic for pumping and, and alarm uh, relay closures and whatnot is taken care of by the uh, controller itself. Uh, one of the other advantages that I didn't mention about ultrasonic is uh, across all of the level technologies, ultrasonic has the distinction of being the absolute most accurate. So if you have a critical application where uh, accuracy is paramount. Ultrasonic actually uh, still is the uh, the king of the hill there. Uh, Siemens recently introduced about two years ago a uh, new product called the LUT 400. Uh, that product has an accuracy of plus or minus four hundredths of an inch over about a ten foot span. So you know to put that in the physical world, that would be an accuracy of about two sheets of paper 
over a 10 foot span. And none of the other level technologies come close to the uh, uh, two ultrasonic in the uh, uh, accuracy range. So, you know, one design consideration is if accuracy is required, you know, it may lead you down the road to uh, ultrasonic. Uh, the dark side of ultrasonic, though, is you have a couple disadvantages. Anything that can affect the speed of sound, uh, i.e., temperature, uh, changes of vapor in the medium. Uh, typically speaking, uh, ultrasonic doesn't work real well with, uh, uh, for example, solvents, uh, toluene, uh, for example, where that vapor space is changing. Um, that can affect the speed of sound and can affect the, uh, the accuracy and repeatability of the instrument. Um, can be sensitive to foam. does work in some foam applications. Uh, we'll talk about foam here on the next slide a little bit more. Um, but uh, the other thing is there's kind of limited uh, pressure and temperature range. Um, speaking with pressure, high pressure, low pressure, basically your transducer here is uh, effectively a speaker and a microphone is really the best way I describe it. And it has to have some sort of medium in order for the uh, sound waves to push against. In other words, uh, typically speaking, that's air. Um, if anybody remembers back to the movie in the late uh, 70s, the old movie Alien, uh, the tagline for that movie uh, is, uh, in space, nobody can hear you scream. Well, uh, the reason for that is in a vacuum, there's nothing for the ultrasonic energy to push against and to propagate through. And so in a vacuum, nobody can hear the transducer scream because it, uh, it won't propagate in that environment. Like, uh, likewise, in very high pressure applications, if you have a, uh, 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 a couple bar of uh, atmospheric pressure pushing on this transducer here, uh, it can uh, be akin to uh, sticking your finger on the uh, you know, speaker of your car radio, where it's, uh, you know, it starts to muffle and or change the uh, frequency and the performance of the speaker. And so in uh, real high pressure applications, uh, ultrasonic really isn't a good choice there. So jumping on to our second non-contact, uh, non-contact, non excuse me? Hey, Mark, a quick question. Temperature ranges. Yes. What, uh, what's, what's ultrasonic good to? Uh, ultrasonic typically is going to be uh, on the high side in the 175 degree Fahrenheit range. Uh, on the high side, so there are some slight variances in that, but uh, you know, I'd say 175 degrees and less, uh, and then down on the low end, uh, it's down in the minus uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit slash 40 degrees C range. So okay. it's a fairly wide temperature range, but uh, not, uh, you know, if you're up in uh, boiling environments, uh, you know, typically uh, there's better solutions for that. Yeah, typically hot. We've so. we've always gone radar, so it's exactly. Yeah, yeah. Radar okay. does have a much uh, wider range there. Um, okay. In fact, uh, you know, we've used some uh, radar applications in uh, molten sulfur and uh, molten steel applications. Did require some special uh, application or installation uh, to uh, mitigate some of the uh, radiated heat, but. Uh, you know, radar does have a much wider range than ultrasonic does. Okay, what do you do? In so high radar. What, what do you do in high humidity vapor uh, atmospheres? Uh, with ultrasonic or just in general? With ultrasonic. Well, typically speaking, um, the uh, the transducers themselves. Uh, do have, uh, for example, the XPS and XPS, XPS 10 and XPS 15 transducers do actually have, uh, unfortunately I don't have a picture that I can call up quickly, uh, but they do have a drip loop uh, built into the face of the transducer itself. So if you have a high condens uh, condensation uh, environment uh, where you have a uh, uh, build up on the uh, surface of the transducer, that drip loop helps, helps to take care of that. There is a uh, non-documented field solution in those applications where uh, you can apply uh, Rain-X to the face of the transducer. That helps to beat up the water and uh, 
the action of the transducer as it fires uh, actually literally flicks the water right off. Um, some people have uh, also uh, mentioned that you could use car wax in that application. I haven't tried that personally. And uh, my favorite uh, that uh, uh, a end user has come up with is he says tobacco juice is a great, uh, uh, a great uh, coating for the transducer. Uh, incidentally, the guy that came up with that uh, was from Louisiana. Uh, it didn't surprise me uh, once I put two and two together there. But uh, Rain-X is a great application for uh, high humidity applications where you do have some uh, buildup on the transducer itself. All right. What, what about the effect of accuracy? Um, in, in so far as, as long as that signal can uh, make it, uh, make it through the uh, uh, the vapor space without being without the speed of sound being affected. Uh, the accuracy is unaffected. Um, what where we run into problems is where that vapor space changes and you have a uh, uh, a change in the speed of sound. And basically, the instrument itself knows uh, all it knows is time of flight. It sent out a signal, and after some period of time, that signal came back. So if there's something that's affecting the speed of sound, even though your level hasn't changed, uh, it, uh, it can actually have a different speed of sound, so a different time of flight. So it may show a different, uh, uh, a different measurement as far as the uh, distance. So in those vapor uh, applications, that really leads us nicely to uh, radar, because one of the great advantages with uh, radar is it's not affected by vapors and, uh, more importantly, dust or you know material in the air. Um, we uh, uh, Siemens recently released again a, a couple years ago a uh, product called the LR560 that was designed for very dusty environments, i.e., the grain industry. Um, that particular unit has also been applied in uh, what I thought was the pinnacle of dusty environments, which was the uh, which was coal silos. Uh, I've applied successfully a number of those up in the uh, uh, Wyoming area, and I always thought that that was the pinnacle, the, the worst of the, the worst that it could possibly be. Uh, spend a day at a at a coal mine uh, on the coal silo, and I thought, you know, there can't be anything that's more dusty than that. Well, I stand corrected. Uh, I recently found uh, probably the dustiest environment out there, uh, which was at a CNH sugar plant out in the Bay Area of uh, California, a little north of San Francisco, and their powdered sugar silo uh, had dust such that when we opened the top hatch of the uh, silo, we had a large, you know, old-fashioned mag light flashlight, you know, the type that had like three or four D cells in it, shining the uh, flashlight beam into this dusty environment. We could see in maybe two or three inches into the silo. Uh, I looked at that and thought, wow, this is this is uh, about as bad as it ever gets. Uh, we deployed an LR560, a solids radar unit, in that application, and uh, the thing performed flawlessly. Was able to see through the dust. Was able to accurately measure the uh, powdered sugar level uh, in the vessel. And even though the uh, device got somewhat coated with uh, uh, with the powdered sugar in the vessel, it still performed flawlessly. So, typically speaking, if your application is a very very dusty environment or if you have changes in vapors, uh, as we mentioned here uh, previously with ultrasonic, um, radar is really your uh, best solution there. Um, it is, uh, will work in a complete vacuum uh, as the radar passes easily through a vacuum. Uh, changes in pressure and temperature as your process is changing and your application is changing, uh, radar works very well in those applications. And uh, radar really has the distinction of kind of being the longest range out there. If you're out there in the, uh, you know, north of 150, 200 feet, radar really is your only solution in that, in that case. Ultrasonic just won't reach out that far. Um, looking at kind of the dark side of radar again, um, the uh, challenges with foam, and uh, I'll dive into that a little deeper, because generally when I'm doing this application or this uh, seminar live, uh, foam always becomes a big issue. Uh, the challenges with foam is that uh, typically your foam is uh, kind of like noise insofar it's very difficult to define and very difficult to quantify. Um, if you can uh, 
imagine for a moment a uh, wastewater application where you have a lift station uh, that's mostly empty, and down at the bottom of this lift station you have some uh, you have some liquid, and on top of that you have a fairly uh, dense, crusty layer of uh, pretty thick foam uh, on that. Now you add uh, you start to add material to this application. And as your level comes up uh, and you add some material and some agitation, your foam layer starts to expand. Now you get to the top of the uh, vessel and you have, uh, you know, a foot of like a light, fluffy dishwater foam uh, at the top of that lift station. What's happened here is your foam layer has changed as your process is changing. And unfortunately, it changes in a, a non-repeatable and really non-measurable uh, method and that can be the challenge for uh, any level application. In fact, I would say probably uh, foamy applications are probably one of our most difficult uh, applications that we run into. Um, and uh, I often say if you can describe uh, and quantify for me how your foam layer is changing, we can measure it. The, the challenge is a lot of times you can't quantify or describe that. Um, now, there's a lot of misinformation running around right now with regard to uh, radar and foam. Uh, while it is true that radar tends to work better with foamy applications than any of the other technologies, uh, I'm going to stop well short of saying that radar is the magic bullet or the solution to foam. Uh, if you ever have somebody that, walk in, that walks into your facility and they say, we have a new radar XYZ unit and it's, you know, it's the solution for foam. Um, I often say that's, that's a salesman talking to you, he's lying to you. There, um, there is no magic bullet for foamy applications. And really with, uh, you know, with the folks on the phone, what I would recommend is if you have a, a foamy application or an application that uh, you know, has a foam layer and you've had some challenges, uh, let's really take that offline and talk about those individually because uh, there are some mitigating steps that we can take. Sometimes that involves using a stilling well. Um, I had one application down in uh, uh, just south of uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where they had a uh, large, uh, oh, I would say it's a, uh, basically a large vessel that was basically the input to the uh, water treatment plant. Well, they had a, uh, a local chemical company that would come in and several times a day would come in with a large uh, tanker truck. Uh, I guess that was like 10 or 15,000 gallons worth of material, and they would dump this into the uh, uh, into this uh, incoming holding vessel, if you will. And uh, as I was there one day when the truck arrived, um, you know they got about six feet of a real light, fluffy foam. Well, not surprisingly, the uh, the uh, ultrasonic unit uh, failed to operate in that application because it just didn't have a good solid surface to uh, reflect off of. So uh, they were looking at maybe going to a radar application. Well, as we were uh, inspecting it, the uh, one operator there pulled out a garden hose and kind of sprayed down to where the, uh, uh, where the ultrasonic transducer was. <coughs> and, uh, you know, he knocked, knocked the foam layer down right there at the transducer. And uh, I said, hang on a sec, let me see this hose. So I took the garden hose, stuck my thumb over the end of the garden hose, made a nice fan spray. And it actually knocked down this light, fluffy foam over a range of about six or eight feet diameter. And really my suggestion to them was uh, to roll over to their local Home Depot or Lowe's or hardware store. And uh, uh, they wound up getting just a uh, cheap sprinkler head. And uh, were able to spray down in there with this uh, sprinkler head. That kept the foam layer down in the general vicinity of the, uh, of the ultrasonic transducer and uh, solved the problem. And it was a... A, you know, a pretty simple solution to a problem that had been plaguing them for a long time. So sometimes changing of the technology isn't really the solution. It's just uh, you know maybe moving uh, moving the measurement, uh, installing a stilling well, um, you know maybe some other mitigating steps. So uh, really the key with foam is uh, you know every foam application is different, and really those are you know if you've got one of those, uh, let's talk about it individually because uh, there are. There are solutions out there, but if anybody ever tells you radar is the answer to foam, could be, but uh, I'm going to stop short of saying it's the magic silver bullet. A um, couple uh, disadvantages with uh, 
radar units is heavy condensation, uh, like we're talking about with, with ultrasonic. Uh, can be a problem for a horn type radar uh, application like the one we have pictured here. Uh, however, Siemens just uh, released here uh, just literally a few weeks ago a new encapsulated radar which uh, is uh, much, much more resistant uh, if uh, not use, or using the word intolerant to uh, uh, condensation applications. So our new LR250 encapsulated radar works really, really well in those applications. Uh, Although it's a new product uh, that was just released for sale, uh, it's been tested here in the United States for the last uh, 12 months. Uh, I have over 80,000 hours of on-process testing uh, with this, and we're very confident that the, uh, you know, that that is a uh, solution for those heavy condensation applications. Um, one of the uh, potential disadvantages with radar also is the fact that the display, uh, the display unit, and the horn is basically integral. So if an operator down at the bottom of this vessel needed a, uh, a remote display, it would require another piece of hardware to do that. Uh, very easy to, to uh, install, but unlike the ultrasonic, the electronics and the, uh, the sensing mechanism, if you will, are uh, one unit in radar, whereas in ultrasonic, you can position that electronics uh, externally. So, uh, Mike, any questions that popped in on radar here before we jump on to the next technology? No, we've got a couple questions, but they'll be more appropriate to hold until the end. Okay, excellent. Uh, guided wave radar and capacitance. I'm going to I'm going to lump those together uh, into one here, just simply because they are similar in their advantages and disadvantages. Um, both of the technologies are a contacting type technology now, and that contacting technology basically is a rod or a coaxial cable, or sometimes in the case of uh, uh, capacitance, it's actually two rods, uh, which go down and they make contact with the material. Now, the main science between or behind guided wave radar is that uh, it uses the principle of time domain reflectometry. And I'll say that one three times fast on the early in the morning here. But basically, TDR is a uh, technology been around for a long time. Uh, in so far as it's been used in a uh, lot of different applications from, believe it or not, CB radios all the way through the current uh, generation of uh, 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 guided wave radar technology. And for the uh, electrical engineers uh, in the field or the electrical guys in the field, if you remember back to Electrical 101, if you have a conductor and you're running a current down that conductor, as you start to increase the frequency on that current, more and more of the current carriers move toward the surface or the outside of the uh, conductor. Uh, a lot of people remember the term called skin effect. Well, basically that's the technology by which guided wave radar works. Uh, guided wave radar uh, sends a high frequency pulse uh, down a rod. Uh, that pulse anywhere where it uh, intera or interacts with a change of impedance, i.e. a change of uh, material, Part of that wave is going to reflect back, and part of that wave is going to continue on to the end of the probe. So I have a little uh, animation. Hopefully this works well over the web, kind of showing that interface application where part of the wave will reflect back. Part of the wave will continue to the end of the probe, and then will return back uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the controller. So the controller, in effect, is using a time of flight as well as it's from the time that the pulse leaves the uh, electronics to the time that it returns. Uh, it's basically measuring that time of flight and then it's uh, using that in order to determine uh, uh, distance down on the probe. Now a couple of uh, key takeaways. Guided wave radar has the distinction of being the fastest of all of the uh, level technologies that are out there. Uh, in fact, uh, guided wave radar, we actually have to slow it down uh, using something called ETS or equivalent time sampling, where we actually have to slow down the number of measurements uh, so that it can work with a, a PLC application. So effectively what the controller does is it will go out, make a thousand measurements, and then report that value to the PLC uh, via, via analog, or then it would update the analog. Uh, the scan time even on the fastest PLCs out there is not fast enough to be able to pick up a uh, single measurement from guided wave radar.
You have to actually slow it down for, uh, for that application. So if you have something where high speed is absolutely uh, critical, guided wave radar may be a good solution for that. One other thing that guided wave radar does allow you to do is you can measure the liquid-liquid interface of two immiscible liquids. Uh, in English, what that means is two things that don't mix. Um, the, probably the most common application for that is oil over water. Uh, in the oil and gas industry, uh, especially in the, uh, uh, out in the field where they're uh, pumping uh, crude oil and water into a vessel, uh, guided wave radar can be able to see the, uh, the bottom layer, which is the water level, and it can also see that interface between the oil and the water, and then also see the top layer of the oil itself. And you, you can get both of those measurements out of a single device. Uh, just about a month ago, Siemens uh, uh, added some additions to the uh, guided wave radar line, uh, really added a lot to the uh, capability and uh, just the uh, number of options that are available in guided wave radar. And uh, so that uh, line has been greatly expanded uh, just within uh, the last month or so. Uh, incidentally, in guided wave radar, this uh, probe can be both a, a could be a solid rod or it could be a cable. So guided wave radar actually can reach out uh, in the range of uh, 250 feet, and I think 246 is the official uh, spec on that, where you actually have a cable that's uh, reaching down into the uh, material itself. Uh, typically speaking, guided wave radar, whoops. Uh, guided wave radar is used in very high and low pressure and very high and low temperature applications. A great example there would be liquefied natural gas. Uh, the LNG market uh, uses uh, guided wave radar almost exclusively for their level measurement. Um, switching over to capacitance, which really is uh, pretty similar in the, the physical connection on it, uh, capacitance basically uses uh, the principle where if you have a grounded metal tank, uh, that basically forms one surface area of a plate, and then the rod itself uh, actually then is a fixed surface area. So the surface area between the grounded metal tank and the rod is a, is a fixed quantity. So remember in a capacitor, uh, two things that can uh, affect that is the surface area, the distance between them, and then thirdly, the dielectric of the uh, of the uh, material in between. So as that material rises uh, up, it changes the total capacitance of the circuit. That is interpreted by the controller as uh, being a change of level. Now, both guided wave radar and capacitance uh, really have uh, similar uh, dark sides or disadvantages. Um, if you have any material buildup or anything that's sticking to the probe, uh, that can be a, uh, a challenge. Probably the best example I saw in that was uh, a, a customer in California that was using guided wave radar in a uh, molasses tank. Well, as your level was increasing or, or basically rising up in the tank, measure the level just perfect. However, once that level started to drop again, uh, basically it was just stuck on high level for an awful long time because that molasses uh, adhered to the, uh, to the rod itself. And uh, so that became a, uh, uh, really an application that was uh, probably poorly selected. Um, if you have a solids application, uh, if your material happens to be abrasive, uh, for, for example, uh, uh, fracking sand would be a good example there. Uh, if it's real abrasive, it can wear away at the rods or the cables. Uh, one thing to take into account is pulling forces on the roof. Uh, I did see a... Uh, a uh, number of photographs of a uh, silo where they hadn't really taken that into account and as the uh, silo was being emptied it literally pulled the roof right off the top of the silo uh, and that was using a, a guided wave ra uh, radar application. And uh, similar to our plumb bob in the very beginning of our discussion, if you have any broken rods or broken cables and that gets down into your process or gets into your material or God forbid it makes it out of the tank and into your process equipment it uh, could cause some damage image there. So, you know, contacting does have uh, a couple disadvantages that are unique to it, but in some applications, uh, that's the best choice. So the fifth and final uh, level that we'll talk about is uh, actually hydrostatic uh, level, which actually is a contacting technology. Um, across all industries, 
uh, hydrostatic level really has the uh, distinction of being the most common or the most, uh, uh, the most prevalent. Uh, used quite heavily in the uh, chemical industry, but uh, it is, you know, across all industries, it's probably the most common level technology out there. Um, really with the, uh, the advantages with that is uh, if you're measuring level in a tank which is not a perfect, uh, you know, perfect square or a perfect silo application, if you have real complex geometries uh, in the tank, uh, hydrostatic level works very well for that application. Um, it is uh, a contacting technology, so, you know, chemical compatibility with your seals is absolutely critical. Um, and then one thing that can really affect it is if you have changes in specific gravity of your material uh, would require recalibration. So if the vessel is used for product A and then at a later time product B comes in and it has different specific gravity, uh, the calibration of your instrument is going to be uh, is going to be suspect or probably inaccurate at that point. Um, and we'll talk about uh, the fitting and piping here in the next slide. If the uh, if the top of the vessel is open to uh, open air applications, um, basically you can use a single-ended uh, uh, a single-ended uh, uh, unit where you're basically just measuring the hydrostatic pressure and your atmospheric pressure is your reference. Now, I did have an instrument uh, an instrument uh, guru of many many years that described to me. He says, "Well, you know, really." Uh, every application that you use is a differential. Uh, in the case where you have an open vessel and it's open to atmosphere, you really are differential because you're comparing the hydrostatic pressure with your um, atmospheric pressure and it is still a differential application. So uh, kudos, kudos to, uh, uh, to him because that is actually true. If your uh, vessel is in fact sealed as your level changes and your hydrostatic pressure changes, it is also changing the, uh, uh, the static pressure in the top of the vessel itself, and there's really two methods to deal with that. One is to use a differential uh, pressure transducer, which is probably most common. The other uh, way to do that is to use a uh, uh, two single-ended or, uh, you know, similar to the uh, transducer that you use in your open vessel, use uh, two single-ended, but then they have to be uh, connected to some sort of uh, control element such as the PLC or something else to actually do the calculation of, the, uh, uh, of that static pressure in your closed vessel. So looking at the uh, five technologies, you know, with all these different technologies out here, how do you choose? How do you decide what's best? Um, well, I pretty much broke this down that there's probably six key questions to ask uh, as far as uh, helping to determine what is your best application. So we'll kind of run through those now. Um, normally at this point, if I'm doing this live, I kind of pull the audience and say, hey, what, what, uh, you know, what, do you, what do you think is the most important question that you want to ask in this application? So really the key question is, what's the material? Right? What, what is it that I'm trying to measure? And then what's its state? Is it a liquid? Is it a slurry? Or is it a solid? And uh, that usually starts to lead you in a direction. Number two is um, contacting or non-contacting measurement required. You know, in some applications, because the material, uh, you know, a great example would be uh, liquid asphalt, very high temperature, and it sticks to everything. Um, in that case, a contacting technology probably is not going to be your, uh, your best choice. So now you're looking at a non-contacting application. Third question uh, kind of came up early, earlier with uh, the ultrasonic. What's the temperature and pressure ranges that uh, the process normally uh, exhibits? So you know, that's going to lead you uh, in a particular direction as well. Number four, what's the distance measurement? Uh, typically speaking, uh, I kind of break this into about three different groups. Uh, group number one would be about 15 feet or less. Uh, if you're looking at uh, rod technology uh, with your contacting technology, such as your capacitance or guided wave radar, um, you know that has to; those rods have to be a solid rod. They can't have any connections to them, so you can't take a bunch of rods and screw them together. And it's really 
a kind of a limitation as to you know what can be shipped. Uh, I can't get U, uh, UPS. I affectionately call them United Parcel Smashers. Uh, I can't get them to ship a uh, a uh, six by twelve inch box without it suffering some damage. Uh, trying to ship a uh, eighteen or twenty foot rod can be a, a bit of a challenge through uh, the freight systems. So you know distance. Short, uh, typically rod technology kind of is your uh, limitation there. Uh, the mid-range, I typically put that at about 120 to 150 feet uh, is kind of being the cutoff point. Uh, ultrasonic really can reach out to as far as about 190 feet on the, on the extreme upper end. That would be under ideal conditions. So, you know, if you're 120 feet or less, you have uh, the option of ultrasonic or radar. Uh, once you get out uh, north of a couple hundred feet, uh, 200 feet, really radar is uh, about your only solution there. So that uh, uh, that gives us a uh, uh, kind of a range, uh, short, medium, and long, and uh, kind of starts to lead you in the direction of one technology or another. Question number five, is it open air or a closed vessel application? Um, until very recently, uh, the FCC uh, in their description of Part 15, uh, did uh, exclude uh, using radar in open air applications. In other words, if you have an open vessel, uh, or you're trying to measure a lagoon or a uh, uh, a lake level, for example, uh, you uh, couldn't use uh, radar in that open air application because the radar waves bounce down off the material, uh, escape out into the atmosphere, and it downs airplanes and causes global warming or causes the price of beef to go up or something. But uh, basically the FCC in Part 15 did exclude radar from uh, open air applications. That would include, uh, for example, non-metallic vessels outside of the building. Uh, uh, so if you had a poly or a fiberglass tank sitting out in the field, uh, te technically radar was excluded from being able to be used in those applications. Now. Uh, there, again, there's a little bit of misinformation running around out there. Uh, earlier this year, uh, about six weeks ago, the uh, FCC did release an amendment to Part 15 of the uh, uh, of the FCC uh, regulations. Now, what some people have interpreted this to be is, oh, the gloves are off. You can use radar without exception in any open air application. Well, uh, that's not exactly true. Uh, there are limitations. In fact, their amendment to Part 15 is uh, uh, quite lengthy in its description. It does uh, take into account beam angle and uh, uh, signal strength of your radar unit. So if you want to use radar in an open air application, uh, let's talk about that. Some people are running around saying that you know you can use it without exception. Um, no, that's not true. And you know, we want to make sure that uh, the application is uh, is valid. Uh, Siemens is in the process of evaluating the uh, uh, evaluating the recent changes in Part 15 and testing, and uh, we will be out shortly with a policy statement describing as to these radar units meet the new requirement and these radar units uh, may or may not. So uh, stay tuned on that. Uh, that's something that's uh, new developments. Uh, I'm excited to see that uh, the FCC is relaxing Part 15, but uh, certainly it is not a uh, carte blanche, do whatever you want in open air. Uh, that's not still not a, able to do that. So uh, more to come on that. If you've got an open air application, again, let's talk about that one offline. Uh, last question of the six basic questions, uh, what material is a vessel made of? Uh, is it a poly tank? Is it a steel tank? Is it uh, a concrete uh, vessel? That can affect what, uh, uh, you know, what technology you may choose. And kind of a, uh, a sub-note to that, as well as what's it made of, but uh, uh, what is the, uh, you know, what's the geometry of the tank? Uh, you know, do you have internal obstructions, uh, for example? So those six questions typically lead you in one direction, but I've got a couple of other design criteria here that uh, uh, could be taken into account in making a decision. Oftentimes, you might have uh, more than one level technology which will work in the application, so I start to look for end user preference. Uh, maybe that's something that uh, you know the, 
They have uh, ultrasonic and several other applications uh, at the site or at the plant. And, uh, you know, maybe radar will work or maybe, maybe ultrasonic will work. Uh, common spares, common training, uh, you know, could be a, a decision if you have more than one choice. Uh, again, looking at the application, are you doing level? Are you trying to do interface between level, uh, between different materials? Uh, are you using open channel flow where accuracy is absolutely uh, paramount? Are you doing some control? Are you doing volume, for example? Uh, all of those can lead you in a direction. Um, what do you have for the physical arrangement? Uh, you know, does your vessel have, uh, you know, the ability to add, uh, you know, to add nozzles or, you know, add entries into the vessel, or is it something where, you know, it would require, uh, you know, concrete coring, uh, which may be cost prohibitive, right? So what's the internal and external geometry uh, of that? What might you have for obstructions on the inside of it? Um, take into account vapors, dust, density, foam, viscosity, specific gravity, you know, how, how does your process change uh, with time? Um, how precise do you need to be? Is, uh, you know, plus or minus a quarter inch good enough? Do you have to be more accurate? If you're uh, plus or minus six inches, are you happy with that? Um, you know, there's a, a number of different uh, solutions there, and it really depends on, uh, you know, what is what is the, uh, you know, how critical is that measurement and how precise do you need to be? A um, couple other uh, design criteria. Uh, what do you have available for uh, current infrastructure? Is there AC, you know, AC power available, only DC? Uh, would you prefer to use a uh, two-wire or loop-powered device uh, going right to a PLC card, for example, or, uh, you know, tying straight into a DCS or a SCADA system? Um, I probably find myself spending more and more time on uh, this one here with the application basics as far as uh, how does it communicate to the world? It isn't just uh, anymore will the instrument make the measurement, but how are we going to get that information to the larger system? You know, do we have, uh, you know, are we using heart, device net, profi bus, mod bus, ethernet? Um, are we just taking a dumb 4 to 20 milliamp to a... Uh, PLC card? Is it a 4 to 20 milliamp heart application? Um, you know, what kind of logic or communication do you need? And uh, we probably could spend an hour just talking on uh, communication networks all by itself. We'll save that for another day. Um, what about diagnostics? Uh, um, are you using, uh, you know, are you doing local diagnostics using a local interface? Are you connecting up using uh, PDM software or Pactware as a very good uh, application that's used in a lot of uh, environments. Both PDM and Pactware talk to a uh, multitude of instruments, not just, uh, uh, not just Siemens instruments, but uh, you know, other competitive instruments out there. Uh, is a heart compatible device important? Uh, many of our, well, yeah, many of our devices are heart devices, and they'll talk to your heart 375 or 475 communicator if that's what's used in the instrument shot. Um, what about the area that it's going into? Is it general purpose, intrinsically safe? Is it a class one, div one, explosion proof environment? You know, that's going to lead you uh, in one direction or another with uh, technology. So with that, um, really the last thing is, uh, you know, are there certificates that are required? Is it something that uh, uh, calibration uh, has to be certified uh, once a year? Uh, to the state DEQ, or, you know, is there a calibration requirement? Uh, you know, that can lead you in a direction or, or two. So with that, that pretty much uh, wraps up the content that I had uh, for, uh, uh, for today. Uh, certainly, I'd open it up to questions. I know, Mike, you said there were a couple that had come in uh, earlier. So uh, maybe we'll uh, start with those and uh, see where that takes us. We have quite a few questions. I'm that sorry. Have in. So we have quite a few questions that have rolled in. So All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Can an ultrasonic be used Excellent. where a four-inch pipe goes into a well? Uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, typically speaking, um, usually when we're looking at nozzle uh, applications where you're going to have a uh, uh, an ultrasonic. Uh, we want the ultrasonic transducer to be able to fit inside of the four-inch pipe, so it would limit you to the number or 
you know, to some of the transducers that we could use. Uh, it would depend on the length or the height of the pipe. Uh, and is that a nozzle going into the vessel or is it a uh, stilling well type application? A uh, stilling well would basically be a four inch pipe that extends down into the material and the bottom of the uh, pipe never is exposed to open air. In that application, uh, you almost could use that without restriction. Uh, if it's something where it's a nozzle on the top of a vessel, so you have a four inch pipe sticking out the top of a vessel, uh, typically speaking, uh, rule of thumb, we use a diameter height ratio of three to one. So in other words, typically I wouldn't want that to see that pipe taller than about 12 inches for a four inch, uh, uh, for a four inch pipe. You know, if it's a six inch pipe, you could typically go to about 18 inches. But in a lot of those applications, um, off the top of the pipe, you can actually extend, you know, put in an extension pipe and uh, hang the transducer further down into the pipe uh, to get around that requirement. So on that one, if I didn't answer the question directly, uh, maybe that would be something that you could contact me offline. Uh, here's my contact information uh, and or contact Lesman and we can talk about, uh, you know, the specific design criteria because uh, short answer is yes, you can, but we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're clear on the application to make sure that there isn't something else that could affect it. So anyway. All right, next question. Another question, Please Mike? Discuss. Pardon? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, next question. Can you discuss the dielectric effect with radar? Oh, sure. Um, basically, with uh, radar, it's looking at the reflectivity of the material itself. So, um, by definition, the dielectric constant of air is 1.0. Okay. Uh, dielectric constant of water, for example, is, depending if you're talking deionized water or distilled water or just plain old water, uh, that's in the 70 to 80 range, okay? And that's typically the, uh, uh, that's typically the range that we see. Uh, Non-conductive uh, uh, liquids such as uh, oil and uh, diesel fuel, uh, for example, uh, typically uh, Non-conductive materials have uh, pretty low dielectrics, uh, typically in the uh, 3 to 10 range. And so basically, um, we'll do a little thought experiment here. If you have a radar unit and we're shooting across the room, and somebody holds up a piece of cardboard uh, in between and interrupts that radar beam, the radar may or may not see that cardboard, depending on the thickness and the uh, the moisture content and kind of the dielectric of the uh, cardboard. Now, if we were to take that piece of cardboard and cover it with silver foil, uh, I think everybody in the room probably would recognize that the uh, uh, that that would give a really good radar return uh, back, simply because the dielectric of the uh, of the silver foil is relatively high, and so it gives a good re uh, reflectivity. Um, when we're talking about uh, foam, for example, one of the challenges is is if you have a light, or excuse me, if you have a uh, heavy, dense, thick foam, you have typically a pretty high dielectric, and so you get real good radar reflectivity off of that. As you add as you add uh, agitation, and that foam layer starts to expand, uh, the bubbles start to get larger. And what are you adding? You're adding actually a dielectric of 1.0 to something that had a dielectric, and so you effectively dilute, quote unquote, the dielectric of the uh, uh, of the foam layer, and that's what why one of the challenges with foam is as those bubbles become larger and kind of light, fluffy, uh, like dishwater type or dish soap type bubbles. There's a lot of air in there and not a lot of mass or a lot of material for the radar to reflect off of. So that, that gives, uh, so in that case, the dielectric plummets and it becomes, a it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to see that, that foam because you're adding uh, dielectric of 1.0, which radar will pass right through. So the higher the dielectric of the material, the better the radar reflectivity and therefore uh, the better return that you're going to get off of the material. And uh, so radar works better with high dielectrics. Uh, however, um, you know, even in the case of uh, diesel oil is a good example, 
something of a relatively low dielectric, uh, we're still able to see that uh, pretty effectively with radar. So depends a lot on the material, and that's why you know in the uh, uh, in the application when we're looking at these, one of our questions is going to be what is the dielectric of the material or what is the material, and that helps us to determine you know if radar is going to even be able to see it. So did that answer the question, Mike? In your mind? Yes, it did. If uh, if, next, if the person that question. asked it, if I if missed something, we'll uh, yeah. Yeah, they can. I'll I'll give them my contact information too at the end. Uh, next question. I've heard yeah. third hand that there's a newer, better radar unit that has higher frequency and or narrower beam beam angle. Can you elaborate on that one a little bit? Uh, I'm sorry, you cut out there. Kind of been asking the question. I missed part of it. All right. This person says I've heard third hand that there's a newer, better radar unit that has higher frequency and or narrower beam angle. If so, can you elaborate on that oh, a little bit? Okay. Yes, I can. Um, actually, I'm going to uh, I'm going to deviate here slightly. I know that we're uh, straight up 10 o'clock here. And uh, I know we had committed for an hour. I'll stick around as long as possible. Um, I did uh, put my contact information up on the uh, screen. But uh, one thing I would also point out, uh, you know, I'm a resource for everybody in the room here as far as being a technical resource. But also, uh, Lessman Instrument, uh, you have the advantage, certainly in this part of the country, of having a very technically competent uh, channel partner uh, with some very good resources that are very well trained and in a lot of cases factory trained uh, on this technology as well. So any of us could be, an, uh, you know, if you have a specific uh, application and you need to run uh, now, uh, certainly you can contact either Lessman Instrument or myself and, uh, you know, we'd be happy to talk about those. So getting back to the question as far as about higher frequency and beam angle. Um, there are, uh, in radar, typically your radar is going to range from about 6 gigahertz on the, uh, on the uh, low end to about 78 gigahertz on the high end. Uh, the high frequency 78 gigahertz uh, is used primarily for solids applications. Uh, in other words, that, that I mentioned uh, the unit that we released for the grain industry. Uh, the higher frequency works really well with uh, you know, with granular solids, uh, wood chips, uh, you know, uh, coal, rocks, uh, glass, uh, even, uh, you know, even some plastics with low dielectrics. Uh, but it really is designed mostly for, uh, again, solids applications. Now, uh, certain frequencies will work better uh, with uh, different material. For example, the 6 gigahertz radar actually works uh, much better than anything out there uh, like for liquid asphalt. Uh, just the frequency of, of, the, uh, uh, of the radar, um, depending if it's a liquid, liquids tend to work really well in the 25, 26 gigahertz range, uh, whereas 78 gigahertz will see it, but 25 gigahertz works better for liquids. So uh, higher frequency, I'll stop short of saying it's better, it is better for solids applications just because of the smaller packet size. You get more reflectivity off of the, uh, off of the uh, solids. But uh, typically what I try and do is let the application choose the technology, not the other way around. Um, I know, uh, you know Siemens has a very wide line of uh, level products. So rather than say, hey, I've got this 78 gigahertz unit and try and shoehorn it into every application I can find, I usually look at the application and say, okay, based on the material that we're measuring and the distance that we're going and the particular uh, criteria, this would be the best technology to use as opposed to taking the technology and trying to shoehorn it into every application. So did that uh, answer the question or kind of clarify the, the frequency difference and where you might use it or not? Yeah, what's the beam angle on the 78? Uh, gigahertz. Uh, the 78, the 78 gigahertz unit actually has the smallest beam angle out there. Uh, it's actually as small as four degrees, uh, which does uh, you know, which does give you the ability to reach out to fairly long distances. Um, but some of the other uh, units, for example, uh, 
some of the ultrasonics and some of the other radar units are in the six and eight degree beam angle range. So, um, you know, beam angle does allow you to uh, uh, go longer distances without uh, being affected by uh, obstructions or if you have a long, uh, narrow silo or something like that, it does work better. Uh, the 78 gigahertz unit does have the smallest beam angle out there at four degrees, but, uh, you know, that may or may not be necessary for the application, so. All right, here's a tough one for you because it's a tough application. Okay. Uh, what, would be, what would be a good type of level instrument for measuring an interface of oil and water where an emulsion can form? Ooh. That, that yeah. emulsion layer uh, in between the oil and water can be a, uh, uh, can be a challenge. The, uh, uh, the short answer to that is guided wave radar would be the only technology that would be possible uh, to do that. Uh, none of the other technologies uh, would work. That emulsion layer um, we would want to talk about and kind of quantify uh, what that is, but typically guided wave radar would be the solution. Uh, we have some new, uh, uh, new guided wave radar that was just released, uh, which I think uh, have a fairly high degree of confidence that we could uh, uh, do a lot of those tougher applications that uh, maybe we couldn't do six months ago. So on that one, uh, I'd say uh, let's talk about that one specifically offline and uh, uh, work with that application and see if we don't have a solution there. Can you talk briefly about the different type of antenna types for radar and how it might impact accuracy? Okay. Um, Typically, the, uh, the radar units uh, fall into three basic categories, I guess. Uh, category number one, and there, there's a couple of uh, subcategories, if you will. But typically, category number one is going to be a rod uh, type antenna. That's going to be almost like a, uh, you know, almost like a whip antenna uh, extending down. Uh, the rod antennas typically are used with the lower frequency radars, the 6 to the 25 gigahertz, for example. And and uh, the rod antennas uh, typically are going to be used in uh, applications where you have a very large vessel, uh, for example, a large uh, two million gallon uh, storage vessel, for example, for, uh, you know, for water or oil. Uh, we used one recently with palm oil down in uh, Southern California. Um, one of the disadvantages with the rod antennas is that they uh, uh, they do have a very wide beam angle, uh, typically in the uh, range of uh, 26, 28, 30 degrees in that range. So if you have a, uh, a vessel with uh, that's fairly narrow and a lot of obstructions, rod antennas typically don't work as well in those applications. But one of the uh, nice pluses of rod antennas is they're very, very uh, resistant or tolerant to, uh, uh, to condensation or buildup on the antenna. So if you have a very, very wet, uh, steamy application, uh, the rod antenna works pretty well. It also tends to work a little bit better in some foam applications. For example, light foam, uh, the rod antenna tends to work a little bit better. Uh, the second type of antenna is typically a horn. Uh, that's usually like a, a spun stainless steel uh, horn. Those horns uh, typically are from inch and a half to about six inches. Uh, there are some larger ones for some special applications. Uh, incidentally, the thing that's kind of backwards on, uh, on uh, horns is the larger the horn, the smaller the beam angle, generally speaking, which to me seems backwards, but uh, the smaller horns tend to have wider beam angles than the larger horns do. Um, those are used a lot in, uh, you know, in enclosed vessels. Uh, one of the drawbacks with those is the horn antennas are uh, if you look down at the base of them, there's a little emitter, which is a uh, little cone-shaped, uh, looks like a little polymer cone in the bottom of the horn. Uh, if you get any type of condensation or material buildup on that uh, emitter, that can, be a, uh, uh, that can be a challenge for you. It can uh, severely degrade uh, the performance of the radar. And really the third type of uh, antenna is uh, what I call an encapsulated antenna. Uh, the LR560 that we've been talking about, that solids level one, uh, actually has a horn antenna, but it's fully enclosed, 
so that uh, none of the, uh, the emitter, for example, is not exposed to the environment. And uh, we just released a new line of encapsulated antennas, which are typically a flange mount, where that horn, it does still have a horn type antenna, but that horn is completely sealed, and it's sealed from your process or chemical environment, and um, that would be kind of the, the third of the uh, uh, three horn types. Next question. Right. Next, next question. How long of a horn extension can you get for radar applications with longer tank nozzles? An example is a concrete tank with a two-inch thick roof. Um, two-inch thick roof would not be an uh, would not be an issue at all. Uh, we do have some extensions that reach out. Uh, I'd have to look up the spec, but uh, it's in the uh, I'd say 40-inch range. Uh, for a horn ex extension uh, that's used a lot in digester applications. So I would say on the order of a, a few feet is uh, pretty possible. Um, but, you know, something where you have just a few inches uh, at the top of a vessel, you know, a six-inch thick slab that you need to go through uh, wouldn't be an issue at all. Uh, we, we've recently sold some that I think we're up to 48-inch uh extension. So we can get them further yeah, there's, and, yeah, and, and, and so that something that's, right. you know, two to six inches, non-issue. So, yeah, go right. ahead. Uh, next question. How can you avoid inaccuracy due to angle of repose in a granular material like sugar? <laughs> um, yeah, great, great question. I love it. Um, really, the, the key to that is going to be, uh, is going to be the setup and the aiming. Uh, all solid material uh, is going to basically build up and also drain at some angle of repose, which is uh, really tied to the physical properties of the material. So in other words, if you imagine a vessel and you're filling from the middle, uh, it's going to basically cone up in the middle of the, uh, uh, in the, middle of the, uh, the vessel or right underneath the fill stream. And like, uh, likewise, or, you know, that's going to build up at some angle. Once it hits the angle of repose that's the physical properties of the material, uh, it is going to just slough off and just start to slide down, and it will, it will hit some maximum angle that it won't build beyond. Uh, likewise, in the draining of that, is if you're pulling from the middle of the vessel, uh, it kind of starts to cone uh, downward. Incidentally, that angle of repose for the draining is identical to the angle of repose of the uh, filling. So really the key to, the, uh, to this application is really going to come down to the aiming of the uh, radar. Uh, ideally, you would want the radar unit pointing perpendicular to the angle of repose for the material, and both on the fill and the drain. Um, but because the, uh, the vessel is not going to be 100% full and you're going to have some you know, build up in the center, uh, there's going to be a, a bit of a trade-off with accuracy uh, insofar as if you're trying to measure that to, you know, one-inch accuracy for total volume in the vessel, you just, when you have solids, you're just not going to be able to get there. So uh, the aiming of it is critical to find kind of that center point of the angle of repose. And uh, from there, you know, you can kind of mathematically figure out what is the, uh, you know, what is the volume that's in the tank at that point, and, uh, you know, you have to, there is a bit of trade-off there with accuracy, but usually in those applications, uh, it's not something where you're trying to measure to the, you know, to the, uh, uh, you know, to, to the pound or to the bushel. Um, you're trying to get a relative, I'm 78% full or I'm 25% full, and so usually we can hit the, uh, you know, the uh, accuracy that's required in those applications. But aiming is absolutely critical with angle of repose. All right. Next, next question. Both radar and ultrasonics measure the difference in flight. What makes radar the preferred technology when vapors are present? Ah, okay. Um, kind of going back to, uh, uh, to the application, if you have changing vapor space, that is going to affect the speed of sound. Um, a great example was uh, I was working on a toluene tank, 
uh, up in uh, Portland, Oregon, close to where I live. And they basically had toluene material uh, with a nitrogen blanket over the top of the uh, uh, over the top of the material because it was, you know, is obviously a flammable or explosive or, uh, material. Um, we were able to dial in the level very, very accurately uh, using ultrasonic. However, uh, as soon as they switched on the agitator for the material, it mixed up the vapor space such that the toluene vapors mixed with the nitrogen uh, in the vessel itself. So the uh, effect of that was that it changed the vapor space, so therefore changed the speed of sound. Uh, in that case, ultrasonic just flat out wouldn't work because we couldn't, uh, uh, we couldn't uh, calibrate to a vapor space that was changing. In other words, the, the vapor space changed, that changed the speed of sound characteristics, and uh, we just couldn't uh, maintain a, uh, uh, a calibrated system. In that case, uh, radar is the solution because radar is not affected by the vapors within the space itself. Uh, so it's not going to affect the time of flight, and so as a result, radar is going to be superior to ultrasonic in that application where you have uh, changing vapors. Great. What is the best technology for detecting and measuring solid bed depth in a water slurry? <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that, is, uh, uh, that is an interesting application. And uh, if the person that uh, asked that question is still on, uh, let's talk about that one offline because I've been doing some field testing uh, for a new Siemens product. Uh, for exactly that application. So to describe the application as I understand it is you have a uh, water layer and underneath that water layer you have some sort of uh, solid which is building up uh, underneath the water and you want to be able to detect, uh, uh, to detect the material uh, that's building up underneath your water. Um, I would uh, love to talk to that person one-on-one -on -one because I'm looking for another uh, another uh, uh, test site to uh, test a brand new product from Siemens for exactly that application. So if you're still on, uh, or Mike, if you know who asked that question, let's uh, reach out to them because uh, I'm looking for a, a field test for exactly that application right now. Yeah. There are a couple other very specific application questions that have come in that I think we'll handle that same way. We'll, we'll reach out and talk to those people individually. Uh, yeah, that's uh, one, one of the uh, last questions that came in is, what about uh, laser level sensors? Oh, um, laser level sensors are not something that's currently offered by Siemens. Uh, we have looked at the technology and uh, have elected, at least at this time, not to pursue it. Uh, one of the challenges with laser is any type of material uh, in the uh, uh, in the space, the vapor space, uh, that could be any type of uh, uh, mist or condensation in the air or dust. Uh, it tends to scatter that uh, uh, the laser uh, energy. Uh, the second thing is uh, lasers tend to be uh, uh, tend to be very very tight in uh, in the uh, beam, if you will. And so if you're looking at uh, a level that uh, maybe has some uh, fluctuation to it, uh, the laser level uh, may not work in that application because you're going to be looking at a very, very small area of a process which, is, which uh, may have some agitation on the surface. And uh, you know, we found it just doesn't work, uh, uh, work well in uh, most of the uh, uh, how should I say, the industrial environments that uh, uh, we, we face. Uh, Siemens doesn't currently offer laser technology, and, uh, you know, oftentimes uh, there isn't uh, really an advantage with radar, or excuse me, with laser that uh, can't be uh, overcome with some of the other technologies that are out there. Um, I know there are some, uh, there are some laser uh, technologies out there, but they're very, very specific in the applications. Uh, they're not, 
you know, can't be very widely used. You have to have just exactly the right process environment for them. And, uh, you know, at, at this point, we don't have anything to or we don't offer laser, but I'd be curious as to, uh, you know, why, uh, uh, why laser would be used that it couldn't be used with, or that another technology wouldn't be able to, uh, to give you the uh, same performance. So great questions. I appreciate it. Um, I know we've kind of uh, gone over the time uh, uh, that was allotted for this, but I think with the, uh, you know, with the, the type and the number of questions that came in, uh, you know, certainly I think, uh, uh, I think we had a, a, a good, well, I'll call it discussion, albeit one, you know, one way today, but certainly I would make myself available. Feel free to reach out and contact me via phone or email or uh, reach out to uh, Lessman Instrument via, via phone or email, and, uh, you know, certainly we can look at specific applications. The, uh, really the key takeaway to summarize this is there is never, you know, one silver bullet solution that's going to be, be all for every application, and, uh, you know, we're the experts, uh, Lessman Instrument and Siemens, so reach out to us, help, you know, let us help you with the, uh, the solution that's out there or with your solution and uh, you know we'll just uh, take these on a one-on-one -on -one basis so with that Mike thank you for the time and the opportunity and uh, for those that are still in attendance it looks like there's uh, quite a few people still out there uh, right now so thanks for uh, participating and uh, look forward to uh, coming out to site and working with uh, a lot of you in the future thank you Mark, thank you very much for your presentation. Again, if anybody does have any specific application questions, feel free to call me at 800-9-LESTMAN, or you can email me at MikeD, M-I-K-E-D, at lessman.com. Uh, we are planning another webinar in May. The topic is going to be to introduce you to Honeywell's latest expert control system, uh, Experian LS. If you have a control system upgrade coming, you won't want to miss this session. Uh, this session will be held in late May. Uh, watch your email for an invitation. At this point, we don't have any further questions, so our presentation will conclude. Again, Mark, thanks for the presentation. And audience, thank you very much for attending. Thanks.